Um, let's begin worshiping together. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good. Thank you, Jay and Nick. Again, glad you're here. Well, I, I wonder, did you take a moment this last week to apply what Pastor Matt talked about last week, to, to stop, to be able to take the, get the blessing of being able to trust God by stopping? I wonder if you were able to do that uh, this week. Well, I wonder also, how was Thanksgiving for you? This is a bit different this year. That's how it is. And somehow I thought... Being able to ask you about your Thanksgiving, I thought I should do it, uh, I don't know, I was feeling weird this week. I want to do it in Dr. Seuss style. How's that? Okay, ready? Was getting where you were going quite a task? Did you eat your turkey with a mask? Did you fly or did you drive? Did you stay home? Sure to survive. Were your plans all thrown out? Did, you make, did it make you want to pout? Whether you were confident or torn, I'm glad you're here with us this morning. <laughs> So welcome, everybody. Uh, I have a couple of announcements for us. Uh, the first one is I want you to be able to fill out your Connect card. There should be a link in the comments section right now. Thank you to our comments people. And so fill out your Connect card. It's a place for you to be able to give us some of your prayer requests. Let us know you're here. Uh, we would love to see you. In fact, I would love for you at some point this morning to make some kind of comment 
right in there and say, hello, hi, family, how are you? Or, boy, I don't agree with that, whatever. I want to hear from you um, in the comments. Next, we want to say thank you to people who gave their turkeys. Our freezer was overflowing. We had a whole bunch of turkeys to give away. Thank you to all of you who generously did that. Uh, and coming up soon is our Christmas shop. December 12th, we will have families coming through here where they'll get prayed for in one part. They get some food given to them, and we give them also toys for their kids, allow them to shop for those. It's a chance to serve families in need. And what we need from you Different churches from all over the city are donating uh, toys specifically for elementary school age kids. And you can do that by bringing your toys by on Sunday morning or during the week if you give a call to the office. And you can drop off those toys. Uh, make sure that they're unwrapped new toys uh, for these kids. And um, we're going to be doing that. And through, I think, December 6th, we're accepting uh, donations for that. So maybe you already did that. You bought something on Black Friday. And lastly, we are still planning on doing a few of the things that were, are traditional for us during Christmas, but they're going to be different because of our different circumstances. We're going to be doing our sing-along, which has been a fun tradition for, for years now, and we're going to be singing Christmas carols in front of a big tree, and look for information on that. You can check our website for more information. And we're also going to be having a Christmas Eve service, and right now we're trying to figure out, it probably, we're not going to be able to be inside at midnight, right? So we're going to be thinking of some other options, but we will have a Christmas Eve service, lighting candles, singing together, a beautiful way to welcome in the Christmas day. During this season of Advent, which is the four Sundays before Christmas, we prepare ourselves for, for Christmas, for Christ, the one who has come, God incarnate, uh, with us. And we, we spend this time preparing for that in lots of different ways, besides buying presents and doing <laughs> lots of uh, fun decorating. We also, here as part of a church, we have a tradition of lighting candles for Advent and to, to think about different themes. And because we're doing this online, we actually have the privilege of being able to invite people from anywhere we want, and I thought this would be a great chance for us to connect with some of our missionaries. So during these four weeks, we're hoping to have different missionaries to come and do the lighting of the candle. So this week, we'll take it to Jonna and Fabio. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of Hope. First Cord Corinthians one three two nine. Grace and peace to you from God or our God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving. I always thank my God for you because of his grace giving you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God's faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Our hope is in God and in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the one appointed by God to be judge of all things. He is the one through whom God has promised to save and redeem his people. This candle reminds us that he is our hope and the hope of the world. We thank God for the promises he has made to us and for the light he has brought into the world. Happy Advent from the Moonizes in Lyon, France. Happy Advent! 
let's continue in worship to our amazingly good God. Sing this together. Do holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder reigns a new and glorious morn. for us to step into uh, Advent and uh, step into this season where we get to sing um, songs that we haven't sung since last Christmas season, and uh, this would be one of those that we haven't sung in uh, a good long time. This is one that uh, our team here at See Me Cove wrote, and it's always been a really special one to us. It's called Sun to Come Down. Sing 
us out. Light broken and darkness couldn't shadow it. And all the ancient promises and now make sense. Word made flesh, you better pay no one. Guess the wonder to heal our brokenness would be so small. And save us all. That's what it means for the sun to come down. That's what it means for a hope to be found. Because the one from the heavens chose to walk among us now. That's what it means for the sun to come down. Every man you will. curse runs deep but something's running deeper still and every single broken heart can now be filled that's what it means for the sun to come down that's what it means for hope to be found because the one from the heavens chose to walk among us now that's what it means for the sun to come down, I remain you well. Oh, 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 oh. I remain you well. Oh, oh, oh. King of Heaven. The King of heaven chose to leave his throne. A crying baby born to bring a soul to wash away all of our fears. Walk beside us in our tears and to bring us life again. It's what it means for the sun to come down. It's what it means for a hope to be found. It's what it means for the sun to come down. It's what it means for a hope to be found. Yeah, because the one from the heavens chose to walk among us now. It's what it means for the sun to come down. I remain you well. Oh, 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 oh. I remain you well. Oh, oh, oh. And you guys can take a seat. Do you feel weary? I think the whole world does right now. And I'm hoping that these four Sundays of Advent will be a blessing to you, people who feel weary. The Advent, like I said before, is a time of preparation for Christmas. And our series during these weeks is going to be called A Thrill of Hope, The Weary World Rejoices, based on the song that we sang just a few minutes ago, O Holy Night. We're going to be circling around this theme of hope. We'll talk about the, the gift of hope, the humility of hope, the struggle of hope, different areas of hope. Because Christmas really is about hope. And we weary people, we need hope. And we need hope more than just the, the twinkling lights or being able to decorate our houses. We need the hope of God with us. Let's pray that we'll have that hope. Lord, we ask you to help us to understand in your word today, to have a bit more of that hope of God with us. May we be people who are motivated by hope, to see you as the true good gift who will uh, then overflow in us into the world. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, presents certainly are not enough to give us all the hope that we need. But I will tell you, when I, when I was a kid, when we were kids, 
the Christmas just captures our imagination. It was thrilling. It was wonderful, right? Because you, you, we all got so excited. We were wondering, what are we going to get? What is going to be the big present? And over the years, there were some things that I got that were really worth being excited about. That uh, I, but oftentimes I think I was a little too often over excited, over anticipating what my parents might be getting me. And some of that was just wrong, wrong expectations, right? I would think maybe they were going to be giving me, uh, maybe my parents would give me a motorcycle this year. You know, when you're eight years old, that is not really, uh, maybe this year I'll get that. That would be nice. But when you're eight, that's not a great idea. Uh, I was thinking maybe they'll get me all of the action figures in that collection I want, or I, I, a bag of money. I don't, I don't know what I was thinking <laughs> that my parents would possibly be giving to me, but I had high, high hopes. And so, of course, when your hopes are that high, you're going to be let down because my parents, like uh, most parents, they did give me nice toys, and they gave me, they gave me clothes, too, which uh, I, I gave some clothes to my uh, six-year-old for his birthday recently as part of his gift, and he was like, Daddy, these, these are clothes. What are you doing? So I, I felt that. He actually said it. I did think it. But what captured our imagination as kids was the thought, the, the hope that whatever we were going to get was going to exceed our expectations, however high they might be. And I want to tell you, the beauty of the Christmas story is just that, that God in his good gift to us exceeded anything that we could possibly expect. Well, the, the Bible is surprising. It's amazing. And, and specifically, the story we're going to read today fits in with that. Let me explain. See, if you were with us during our study in Immerse that we did before, where we went through the whole New Testament, you might remember that the book of Matthew is considered the most Jewish of the four gospel accounts, the four stories about the life of Jesus that's in our New Testament. That it, it was intended to go to an audience of people who understood the history of the Jewish people, who knew the stories of the Jewish scriptures. And so in the start of this, in Matthew 1, we're going to be reading in the book of Matthew today. In Matthew 1, Jesus is introduced as this. He says, Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So we, we see these huge figures from the history of the Jewish people, David, Abraham, and even calling him this term, the Messiah. And then at the end of chapter 1, we have Jesus' birth. And there is no way, after this long genealogy of his Jewish roots, there's no way in this Jewish book that you would expect what comes next. There's no way you would guess that what happens next is what actually happens next. And turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. And it says this, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So what do we get? We get foreigners. We don't get uh, Jewish scribes who know what's supposed to happen and they say, This is the one, this is the Messiah we are waiting for. We get foreigners who come from the east. And on top of it, they're probably pagans. These are people who were not worshiping the God of Israel. And we don't know totally what the word magi means. Maybe astrologers. These were, uh, we learn a little bit about them from our text, but we don't know very much about who they are. But they've come from the east, and they've come to look for this newborn king. And they first go to Jerusalem, of course, because they're expecting that at least that's an important place. That's where you would find somebody who's going to be a king. And they, maybe it's going to be even Herod's child, Herod's son, who's, who's going to get this. And so they go to him, and it says, verse 3, When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. 
he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Uh, spoiler, alert, spoiler alert, that's not actually what he intends to do. Anyway, after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. So whoever these magi were, they saw themselves as having enough, well, they had enough clout to be able to go and meet with a king. Presumably they've come with their big entourage, their um, caravan to come meet this king. And they saw themselves as being worthy of being able to be ambassadors to meet this newborn king. So imagine, you know, they've studied for uh, the stars for a time. They, they looked, and they eventually saw this sign, and they said, hey, let's gather our group. They gather their group together, and they travel, and they, they wait, and they hope, and they wonder. And then when they meet with these uh, experts in the law, the, the place is shown to them. It's going to be in Bethlehem. And it says that they were overjoyed and I love, that's what it says in our English translation, but in, in Greek it says, they rejoiced with great joy exceedingly. I feel like it's, it's kind of falling over itself to multiply, multiply this feeling of hope that now they get to rejoice because their, their hope is coming to a point. They're going to be able to see this king. Verse 11, on coming to the house, They saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. (laughs) By the way, where do you think we get the idea traditionally that there are three in the group of magi? Uh, All it says is is there are magi from the east. Um, but I, I think it's, it, you know, it's only here in the Gospel of Matthew that we have the Magi, uh, but it doesn't say much more than that. I, I think it comes from the gifts that they gave, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, maybe we traditionally just think that that means that each one brought that one gift. Anyway, what we have here is a surprising image. It, it's, like I said, there's probably a large entourage of people who have come, and now they go to this village of Bethlehem outside of Jerusalem, about 10 miles away, and they go there, and they arrive at a, a normal house. And, and, and this, I think, is what the kingdom of God looks like. It's amazing. We have great people and minor people. Think of in Luke where they talked about the shepherds who had come from the fields. They're people meeting together and uh, and who have come around this same child, this king. They bow to Jesus the king in worship. Great and small, we come together to meet around Jesus the king. And they bring these surprising gifts. They, these were amazing treasures. They, they bring expensive gifts, gifts that were meant for a king, these spices and gold. And that they should bring gifts, I think, is, is a a beautiful thing. You know, the, uh, the shepherds, they didn't bring any gifts. They did bring their, their testimony, which is beautiful in its own way, that they just came as they were. But the, these who came, they had gifts to bring. And I, I think it makes me think of a couple different things. The first is that Scripture speaks of the nations bringing their riches and glory to God. And, and here we have these foreign dignitaries who are bringing gifts And it sounds a lot to me like some of these passages. Let me read a couple to you. Psalm 86, 9. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. Micah 4, 2. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so we may walk in his paths. And Haggai 2, 7. Remember we studied Haggai earlier this year. I will shake the nations, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. And even at the end of our Bible, at the book of Revelation, we're given a picture of of God's holy city, this redeemed and beautiful, peaceful place. And John says this in uh, Revelation 21, beginning in verse 22. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. 
The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will the gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. So the, it's this, that's what I see when I see, uh, see these magi. I think this is a foretaste of people coming and giving their good gifts, bringing them to God. The second thing is, is that in here we have a picture of, it's a perfect that there's a people giving a gift because our God of hope is a gift giver himself. The, the Magi were really ultimately just reflecting the giving heart of God. At the center of the story is, is God himself who's a giver. I think of in chapter one in um, Matthew, there's, it talks about God giving a gift. It says this, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And the gospel writer John, when he talks about this, he says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. So the Bible is saturated with this idea of the self-giving love of God and that we see it in Christ here in this house, in this plain place. Yeah, I, I think about in Islam, it's interesting. In Islam, they say that there are 99 names of God. And, and one of them is actually that the, the God is compassionate, loving. And what does that, what does that mean if God is, 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 sim, is they, they say that God is one, but like a simple oneness. Uh, that, that who did God love before creation? And we can wonder that and ask that. Uh, Whereas we believe, as, as Christians, we believe in a triune God, that, that God's love is intrinsic to who he is. If God weren't like that, everything would be completely different in our understanding of how God is, acts and how we're supposed to act. Uh, around, around the time of Shakespeare, there was a pastor named Richard Sibbs who wrote this. If God had not a communicative, spreading goodness... He would never have created the world. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were happy in themselves and enjoyed one another before the world was. So there's this overflowing of God's love into us. It's a very different portrait than what we get in other, even um, monotheistic religions, that, that, cry, that this nature of God is of love that actually is built into who God is and it overflowed to us. They enjoyed one another before the world was. And, and Sibs goes on to say that if God didn't have this impulse to communicate and spread his goodness, there never would have been a creation and there certainly would not have been a redemption. That God's overflowing goodness actually is why there was a creation and it's certainly why God was willing to redeem us, come and save us. So our triune God communicates, wants to interact with us. He sought to interact with his creation. He's not off somewhere else leaving us be. He wants to be with us. And he has this spreading goodness, as Sib says, about him. His love naturally overflows into others. It spreads. And, and that's why there was this creation, that God didn't need us, but it, his love overflowed to create and if the fact that the Magi have anything in their hands at all to be able to create is because the God created a world where there are things that we can choose to use in giving and give to others. And God's spreading goodness also is we find that there's this redemption, that God's love overflows for us way more than we even deserve, that we get to be people who are with him, that he would seek us out, that he would save us. That is the one that they have come to in this house. The one that Magi worship is the one who has come to seek and save the lost. So ultimately, the gift of God is his spreading goodness, this overflow of himself, really. And scripture is going to point us to two particular gifts of God's and God's self that we get. The first one is, of course, Christ himself. 
And, and this is where Christianity really is different from other faiths. If you, if you know what God is like at all, it's because of who Jesus is. We have him here for us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we can never arrive at who God is by starting with some abstract idea. We have to begin with Jesus Christ himself. The gift of this word of God made human. So in Christ, God is communicating something about himself. What God is like. If you wonder what God is like, we can look at Jesus Look at this even act of becoming human, the the act of self-giving love on the cross. It does communicate something about who God is. But even more, God is actually redeeming us also in Christ. Because one of the places in Scripture where the word gift is repeated a lot actually relates to the sacrificial system where it talked about us bringing our gifts to the altar where people would come with something to sacrifice to God. They would present to God on on the altar in worship. And in the the New Testament, we learn that Christ himself was that gift, the offering, the same gift put on the altar. Christ gives life to the sinful world. And here we have this king who's completely worthy of all the Magi's gifts. We find out then later that this king was willing to serve us by dying for us. Not only does that tell us something about who God is, it actually does get us redemption. The second amazing gift, so the first is Christ. The second amazing gift is God's own spirit. In a quick look through uh, my concordance and looking through different passages, I saw at least 15 times where the New Testament talks about God giving us his spirit as a gift. And I'm not talking about the gifts of the spirit, but that his spirit itself is a gift to us. Let's look at a couple of those. Acts 2.38, uh, Peter is talking to a group of people who just saw a miracle and they said, well, what should we do to be saved? And he says this, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So so the Spirit in us is proof of this relationship with God. It comes from our faith, and it's proof of this. 1 John 4.13, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his Spirit. That God gives this to us freely. It's beautiful. So God, whose rightful dwelling place is the palace of heaven, has chosen to dwell in us, regular people. And he works in us. He's, he's working in you. So the, the biggest areas where we see the work of the Spirit is in a, a few different places here. I, I, the Spirit confirms the message of Christ. He, he makes us appreciate Jesus Christ for who he really is. So if you feel like you've grown in your appreciation for who Christ is this year, that is the work of the Spirit in you. It's proof that God's at work. He's pointing to what he's saying. I want you to know me. So I give you my spirit to show you and make you closer to me and know me better. The next thing that the spirit does in us is helps us to grow in Christ-likeness so that we will be more like what God is like. That we have this spirit in us pushing us to be like God. A writer once wrote, he, he said, that we become what we worship. And for us, we need to have a right picture of who God is, to look at Jesus and understand who God is. That shapes us and who we are. And we become what we worship. And in the twisted ways that we worship bad things, we become those kind of small, broken idols. But as much as we begin to look at God and his holiness and goodness, we become like him. That process of becoming like God not always comfortable, not always fun, right? I have to admit and acknowledge the places that don't fit for me. I look at the pettiness and the terrible things that are in me that don't look like God, and I have to be willing to be shaped by that spirit. If you this year have been challenged in your thinking or in the way that you act in your habits, if you hear that voice of the spirit pushing you, That is 
evidence of the Spirit at work in you. And I want you to partner with the Spirit. That is evidence that God is working in you. And thirdly, I, I see evidence in Scripture of God, God's Spirit building his church. And I think it's connected to these first two things. It's based on this message of Christ. It's based on people moving forward in Christ's likeness and doing that together. It's not an individual deal. God never intended for us to be individual Christians, but to be Christians in a group of others. That's why we say things like our Father, not my Father who is in heaven. And so they, they do work together, but the Spirit is working for unity in the church, and, and it's a tough time. Uh, I've talked with people at different ends of the spectrum this last week who are having a hard time with the unity of the church. They feel separated from one another. But what's beautiful is that we get to worship one God, one Lord, one baptism. We are people who are unified together. So we read Scripture in church and are shaped by it, and we work toward unity. And it's not going to be always easy, but that's evidence of the Spirit's work in us. So he's helping us to grow in Christ's likeness, honor the Son, glorify the Father, honor to love our neighbor. So we have this God who's spreading goodness around us, giving us Christ, giving us the Spirit, and working in us. And in response to this, let's do a couple of things. Let's think of a couple of concrete things we can do. The first thing I want us to do is simply to accept God's good gifts. The, the God, our God is amazing because God wants to give to you rather than take from you. Uh, that sets our God apart. He's amazing. Accept God's good gift of Christ's salvation for you. Maybe you've never made that step. Uh, this would be a great time for you to make that step. Let's, let's pray in a moment for that to happen. Accept the, the Spirit's work in you. Partner with the Spirit. Accept that as a gift to you to, to confirm who Christ is and who we are and pressing us to unity together with others. Let's take a break right here in the middle just to pray. Uh, let's pray f for these things. Lord, I want to accept your good gifts that you have for me. Uh, I see only in part, but I know that you are good and you save, and I need a Savior. So I accept your good gift, and I ask your Spirit to work in me. And if you've been working in me, to work in me more deeply this week and this month. Looking forward to Christmas. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. I want to tell you, if that's your first time praying that, as simple as that, that is the beginning of your journey with God, that you can be saved by simply turning yourself over and accepting God's good gift. People who have accepted God's good gift, we need now to let the abundant, generous, giving heart of God's goodness to overflow to other people. So if God's if our view of God is supposed to overflow in our lives, and if we become what we worship, we, let me tell you, we worship a God who is amazingly generous and giving. So let's let the gifts that we have go to God's glory to reflect, let our lives reflect the nature of this amazingly generous God that we serve. I, for example, I heard this week about someone in our church who's purposely greeting their neighbors, and trying to sit out front and say hi to people. People need that right now. Uh, I think about all of you who gave turkeys this week to be able to serve people who need something. I, this week, I appreciated the work of Terry Forlisi and Dennis Kelly, Kathy and Jeff Whip, and Kelly Healy, who did not only this backdrop for here, make it look real Christmassy for all of us, but they did something for those on-site people outside, too. Uh, thank you. People using their gifts, doing things that I couldn't do. You are uniquely gifted. You have gifts that God has given you, and I wonder how you can use those things. Your, your time and your talent, the treasure God has given you, how can those things move to show God's generous heart, demonstrate to the world what an amazingly good God, to say, God, I, I am looking at you. I want to be more like you. I think for us to become more and more generous as the years go by is a reflection of us looking more like God. So let's do that. Let's use our life for people. And I want to tell you, when you're doing it, why don't you give glory to God? Uh, it's easy for somebody to say, you know what, Jay Denton is the greatest guy ever. And if he gives somebody a gift, and he can say, you know what, 
God did this for me. God gave me a great gift, and I wanted to pass it on to you. He gives glory. You can give glory to God in those ways. To say to somebody, you know, I'm doing it because of what God did. So may your imagination be captured by the hope that is Christmas right now. I pray that it will be something bigger than what you expected. It may be a quieter Christmas this year, but in that quieter Christmas, may it offer you the gift of Christ. The Spirit in you, the Father who gives good gifts. So may you feel the thrill of hope of the Magi and rejoice with great joy exceedingly at, his, at being able to find him. Let's pray. Lord, we know that you are a good, good God. You love us so well, and you overflowed into our lives. May we be people who see you clearly and then reflect you in our lives. And may we be people who are generous, good gift givers. Uh, may this image of the Magi, people coming from the, around the world, around you, worshiping you, may that motivate us this season. We, we worship with a worldwide church of people who, who celebrate your name, and we, we're glad that we're yours. May, may we serve joyfully, exceedingly joyfully this year, uh, pointing people to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, thank you, Kurt, for that message. And, um, and we're going to step into now a time of offering where th this is a chance for us to really reflect on what Kurt's just preached, uh, to really let those words and the, uh, the realities of the gospel really sink in at a level that sometimes we can gloss over. And so uh, as we do that, as we sing this song, um, we're going to be singing Good, Good Father. And it's a song you guys know very well at this point, and really just let these words wash over you. Um, as Kurt's been talking about trusting that, that God is good and that he is a good father and that he does give good gifts, um, sing this with us. And while we sing this song, we're going to have the offering links up for you on the screen that you can check out uh, if you'd like to give with us and be thinking of ways that you can be giving, not just of your resources financially, but of your lives, of your time, of your talents um, in the community and in the world around us. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you, you tell me that, that you're pleased and that I am never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. And I see many searching for answers far and wide, but I Searching for answers, only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways.
sing out love so undeniable. Love so undeniable I can hardly speak and be so unexplainable I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love love your good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am, it's who I am. your good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i So we pour out our praise to you only. 
we're going to sing one last song together. So if you would, even if you have not been standing so far, I encourage you to stand with us as we sing this last song together, Forever Rain. Sing this out. You are good, you are good when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love on display for all to see. You are light, you are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope. You have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, and you death is lost to sleep. And though I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reigns. You are more, you are more than my words will ever say. You are Lord, you are Lord. All creation will proclaim You are here, you are here In your presence I made whole You are God, you are God All, all else I'm letting go And though I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms The riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever i'm running to your arms i'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace Light of the world forever reigns. My heart was seen, no other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart was seen. No other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing. No other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing. No other name, Jesus, Jesus. into your arms I'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever Well, let me send you off with a blessing. And 
uh, I, would, I would love for you maybe to clasp your hands and receive this blessing. Lord, I pray for these who are hearing this right now. May you who are hearing this, may you know the gift of Christmas, to feel the generous heart of our God who has given us abundantly of himself. And may you also give of yourself this week to give of your time, to give your attention to those who need it. And may it be to the honor and glory of God. We pray in the name of our triune Lord. Amen. Have a great week, everyone.
Y'all have a great rest of your week, and we will see you again next week.